Good afternoon. I'm Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, and it's an enormous pleasure for me to welcome you to do this discussion with Robert Zellick on his new and magisterial work, America in the World, A History of U.S. Diplomacy and Foreign Policy. I hope you can see it. No small tome. It's fantastic to have you with us, Bob. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. We have about 300 people with us today from all over the world, and I thank all of you for joining us. Let me give you just a little bit of background on Bob Zellick, uh, introduce uh, our own colleagues, uh, and then we'll get started. And at the very end, we'll save a little time for questions from our audience. There is a question function, so when we get to that moment, please uh, uh, use those and we'll will draw upon your, your interesting remarks. Let me just say, Bob Zellick comes to this subject with extraordinary personal experience as a former senior policymaker, architect of US foreign economic and foreign policy, having served in the White House as Under Secretary of State to Secretary Baker as USTR, as president of the World Bank. And I think each of us here about to engage him can each think of important US policy areas that have benefited and been defined by his vision and leadership. Among the areas most familiar to me, I would note his critical role during the reunification of Germany, his rearticulation of the role for trade policy and its principal instruments, including launching the Doha round in the name of security and economics, and a framework around trade that supported multilateral, regional, and bilateral frameworks. His articulation of a perspective and challenge to China to become a responsible stakeholder in the global system. His leadership at the Rio Biodiversity Convention, an important starting point on climate. And his revitalization uh, leadership of the World Bank. Joining me in today's discussion are three remarkable Columbia scholars. Professor Adam Tooze is the holder of the Shelby Cullum Davis Chair of History at Columbia University and serves as director of the European Institute. He has written an, ex an extraordinary recent book called Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crisis Changed the World and been recognized in 2019 as one of the top global thinkers of the decade. Adam, thank you for joining us. Also, two of my own faculty at SIPA, Stephen Sistanovich, also a Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of International Diplomacy in his case. He's also director of the International Fellows Program and his most recent work, Maximalist America in the World from Truman to Obama, he served several posts in government, including at the Department of State and uh, at uh, Carnegie Endowment. Tom Christensen is a professor of public and international affairs at SIPA and director of the China and the World Program at Columbia University, which he brought from Princeton. He also served for a period as deputy assistant secretary of state for East Asia and the Pacific. Thank you, Tom and Steve. Uh, as well. So let me just say this book, in my view, is really a sweeping work of history with lively stories about remarkable individuals, great figures, and some more obscure. And you have brought history to life, boldly taking on Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, John Quincy Adams, every American president, it seems, since Lincoln, William Seward, John Hay, Charles Evan Hughes, and more. And uh, you illuminate what you've identified as five enduring US traditions that have shaped US domestic and foreign policy since the founding of this nation and the inescapable tensions among these themes. So I think this book couldn't be more timely as we are in a moment of enormous challenges for the United States at home and abroad, whether it's driving economic recovery and the space the president of the United States will have around the themes uh, you illuminate here, rekindling alliances, expanding multilateralism, finding uh, scope for collaboration, 
So I'd like to start us off with, I hope, the inescapable question every author should be allowed to address uh, uh, and then turn to our experts. So could you tell us, Bob, how you came to frame this book and what are the most important insights you want to linger with the reader? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the gracious introduction. And let me say it's a particular uh, delight to be with a SIPA audience because I hope as our discussion will reveal, I kind of designed the book in some ways for uh, the type of students who would come to SIPA. Um, also, I think I, I cite all of your works in my notes. So that's another plus for a speaker. Um, I was also pleased, I think um, the, your two colleagues from SIPA are political scientists, but they write great about history. And then we brought in a real honest historian here with Adam Tews. And of course, the coordinator, as you and I would agree, Merritt, is a lawyer, because lawyers are the ones who bring all these uh, together. So to, to connect that with the story of the book, um, when I was in government, I, I drew a lot on history as I tried to think about problems. So the real purpose of this book was to try to encourage others, especially those in the next generation. Um, as, as all of you would know, and probably most of the audience, many foreign policy courses these days seem to rely on international relations theories. And while they're fun to play with intellectually, my experience was they were of limited use when I'm dealing with German unification or genocide in Darfur or trade or other topics. And so I wanted to focus on practical problem solving. Now, this group will probably be aware that Henry Kissinger wrote a book titled Diplomacy in the 90s, where he used history uh, to talk about foreign policy. When I read the book, I was struck that I reflected in my view of the European real politic perspective. So one of the other purposes of this book was to try to draw on the American experience and ideas. And then in those various government posts that you mentioned, Merritt, I used to often ask my younger colleagues of what they had learned about history, because I honestly didn't know. I suppose I used to torture them a bit with questions. And I discovered that insofar as they had learned history, it tended to focus on World War II and the period afterwards. So there wasn't as much knowledge about the first 150 years. And as you mentioned, there's a wonderful series of characters and issues that we dealt with. And so I wanted to return some of those from the mists of time. The approach I took in the book was to use stories uh, in some ways, the book is a multiple biography. I wanted to appeal to more readers that way, but also by focusing on individual episodes and then adding my assessment, I was trying to give people an insight on at least how I thought people tried uh, to get things done. And I suppose uh, there was another little message here, which is at a time where I found a lot of uh, sort of graduate students being uncertain about what they could get done in the future. I was trying to suggest that imperfect results in a far from perfect world are still sort of a reasonable effort. Um, and so um, my, my hope here was also to draw on history in a slightly more optimistic way, the notion that history offers insights on how to do better, not just uh, acceptance of timeless obstacles. Thank you very much. Well, now let me hand this over to our historian, Adam. Well, may I first say uh, what an extraordinary pleasure it is to be on this call. Thank you, Merritt, for bringing this all together. It's wonderful to be able to collaborate with colleagues in SIPA and, and to be able to do so whilst reading Bob's, I mean, really brilliant, fascinating, wonderfully well-written book. So thought-provoking is a true privilege. Uh, as you can tell, I speak English with an English accent, but in fact, I grew up in West Germany and I was in Berlin in 89. And um, it's actually quite moving to encounter one of the architects of that process of reunification, which I don't think that my generation of West Germans, we just never thought it would happen. And if we did think it would happen, we thought it would be cataclysmic. And, and that's, we escaped the shadow of the nuclear holocaust that hang over all of my teenage years and came out the other end into one of the great success stories, not just of European, but of modern history, frankly. The Europe of today is a product of that last some would say perhaps the last, but that's that pessimistic phase of American statesmanship. It was an extraordinary achievement and um, your, your cohort and you yourself deserve great credit for that moment, which I think we agree on the panel, you underplay in the book in the sense that the, the narrative peters out where it does. But what I wanted to ask, start by asking was a, was a historian's question, because one of the things I love about this book as a historian is that it's so opinionated. Um, you undersell it, you know, it's a series of stories, you're gonna take people back in time. 
another way of reading this book is that it's a it's a pro highly programmatic exercise. Um, what you're claiming is there is a diplomatic history of the United States, a country which has often been uncomfortable with diplomacy. And furthermore, it needs to be understood in intellectual terms native to the United States. In other words, this is not a Kissingerian book about diplomacy and the pitfalls of American utopianism or anything else. And I thought that was remarkably interesting as a project. So how does one write a American history of American diplomacy? And again, it seems to me you make exactly the right move. You go to the strongest intellectual tradition native to the United States, which is the philosophy of pragmatism. So I guess my first question was really, can you tell us a bit more about how you understand this tradition of pragmatism in the US? How you see it as distinct from other people's pragmatisms? Because other states, notably the Chinese, are often credited with programmatic pragmatism. And then a slightly more edgy question in a sense, one of the conditions of pragmatism, which you frankly acknowledge is optimism. In other words, there has to be a sense of a positive trajectory and an open-ended future. And checking the PDF that we had handily, if you search on optimism, the last mention of optimism is in the chapter on Ronald Reagan. So I guess the question for me is, where are we now with that optimistic pragmatic project? So let's start with the key point about uh, pragmatism. Uh, you're undoubtedly correct about my effort to use this as a, as a unifying theme. And it makes the, the simple point of focusing on results over theories, which I touched on a little bit about international relations. Um, some in the audience may not be aware of this, although you reference it. As you said, you know, students of philosophy will know that pragmatism is probably the most distinctive American contribution to philosophy with William James and John Dewey. And that simple logic was to uh, sort of reject abstractions and dogmas and timeless truths and instead to focus on the practical consequences um, that would, would flow from experience. So one begins with a problem, one looks with experience, you try to match means and ends. Certainly involves more experimentation pluralism, dynamism, recognizes chance and contingency. And so in your comparative sense, you're correct. I wanted to look beyond sort of European real politic theory. Um, it's also a way, you know, connecting to some of your work, that's more likely to draw in um, economic and transnational mm -hmm. factors in addition to the traditional sort of power politics. Um, I think in, and so in that sense, um, the, the, it is a book of, of ideas as well as stories. Each chapter is trying to represent kind of a, a pluralistic contribution uh, to the American portfolio of, of diplomacy. Um, in the case of China, uh, and, and certainly I'm not suggesting that other countries aren't, aren't pragmatic. I would, without getting into it too much detail, I think in China, the foreign policy still represents very deep sense of historical uh, resentments and grievances um, that go back, uh, you know, at least uh, through the, the 19th century and imperialism. Today, it's connected somewhat with a hubris of amazing accomplishments. I think we see signs of the tributary state concept uh, in China uh, through some of its policies, which is different than the United States. And to be frank, where I differ with some of the proponents of the new Cold War is that I actually find China more an example of, of Han chauvinism than sort of Marxist ideology uh, expanding to other, other parties. Um, they certainly use Marxism as part of the central control system for an authoritarian system. But if you think about their relations with Vietnam, you know, they're not necessarily uh, sort of communist brothers. But to take pragmatism one step further and help people understand how I would apply this to diplomacy, it starts with the simple question of sort of what, what, what works and what that leads you to is pay attention to realities on the ground. So that would mean power, whether economic, military, technological, sometimes votes, uh, processes and institutions, how they work in fact, as opposed to the theory, uh, positions of others and their interests and how to, and of course, a shrewd sense of timing. And this point that I mentioned that, you know, in, in a pragmatic world, sometimes imperfect results from a far from perfect world are, are, are sort of still uh, should, should count as, as, as a satisfactory achievement. As for your point about sort of optimism, as you know, I, I end the book really with uh, 
Bush 41. So I, I, and then I have an afterword where I try to apply the five traditions. And I guess in a true historian sense, I'd say it, it's too early to tell about the time afterwards. But what I, what I would suggest by that is, I actually, when I think about uh, US capabilities and resources and potential drawing a little bit on the Reagan experience, there are tremendous opportunities here. And frankly, if you look at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs public opinion polls, there's actually broad support in the United States for alliances, international engagement, trade and others, but it's somewhat inchoate. So that brings us back to the fundamental challenge of you know, what will the political leaders of the countries direct us towards? My own guess is that it'll be a combination of some of the frameworks I discuss in the book and then specific policies dealing with well, climate, biological security, China, you know, uh, so on and so on. Thank you. Uh, uh, one of the one of the knocks on pragmatism is that it can easily be a kind of ad hocery. Um, and one of the things I found fascinating about the book is that, in fact, you don't, as it were, dissolve into that at all, because as Merritt already suggested, in fact, the facts on the ground come rather neatly organized for us in the book. There are these five fundamental forces that you would constantly bring us back to, not simply material. So some of them are trade technology. Another one is the network of alliances. The third is the geopolitics, if you like, of the United States and North America in particular. Then uh, we have the facts of politics in modern societies. And finally, also in a sense, a reality that as Americans one has to take seriously. In other words, the discursive continuity of the meanings of the American idea. Those that again and again, this has proved to be something more than merely ideals that radically undersells it. And the question for me thinking about the 21st century, because it strikes me that that's a really sensible list of the facts that we should focus on, is whether or not something has not shifted or been added to that list that is distinctive and new about our epoch. And that seems to me to be the climate question or the environmental question, because all the way back to the beginnings of the founding to the 18th century, there is a sort of cornucopian sense of the limitless abundance of nature that will underpin our projects. And it seems to me we have run up hard against the limits of this. And I'm not asking you at all, this is a hostile question, because one of the less remarked features of your illustrious career is that at two key moments, you're actually in at the founding of the modern climate diplomacy regime. But I'm kind of curious how you fit climate and modern environmental diplomacy into your thinking as a protagonist of that, of that problem as much as anything else. <clears throat> so first, just a brief comment on sort of the, the dangers of sort of pure pragmatism. Kissinger makes a point, which is a good one, about the dangers of what he calls strategic nihilism of just case by case thinking. So what I try to do in the stories and my own view is to suggest you really need a combination. You need some sense of framework and strategy without, about, while retaining the flexibility to deal with issues. Kissinger makes another point, which is a good one, which is sometimes all problems can't be solved. Sometimes they can only be managed. And I think that's another sort of reasonable point. So uh, again, unlike some books that sort of just sort of take one idea and try to pound it, I'm sort of representing the pluralism of, of concepts here in a pragmatic sense. But I do try to emphasize some of the distinctions and, and kind of where, where they either support each other or disconnect on the edge. Now, on the environmental topic, um, it, as you would know, I mean, this is a field that's sort of been uh, discussed on the edges. You know, I remember Jared Diamond wrote this book about collapse and sort of uh, these sort of cosmic events. So I, in my view, they've always been part of global issues. Sometimes historians just, you know, whether it's famines or floods or pandemics or other types of things. The way I tried to address it in the book is I put a chapter in on a man named Van Ever Bush, who you wouldn't find in most books on foreign policy. And um, for, for people that don't know him, he was a, a MIT vice president and dean. He was the head of the Carnegie Institute of Science. But people in the scientific field really know him as the godfather of American science policy after World War II. He wrote a report, which I explained how he got FDR to ask him to write the report, <laughs> which was called Science, the Endless Frontier. And uh, it, I included it in part because, as you mentioned, a lot of the books about geopolitics, I probably work in more economics as your work does. But I also wanted to suggest that science and technology will be an increasingly important component of foreign policy uh, going forward. 
I also explained how I think it was important to the US success in the Cold War. Today, if you read the newspapers, it'll be an important aspect of the competition with China. But as you mentioned, I also wanted to alert people to the challenge of how do we integrate some of the scientific work in this field with the traditional uh, diplomatic work, particularly in foreign policy. And so, I mean, just to give you some of the examples, as, as you mentioned, um, I was, was kind of the lead in the US on the Global Climate Change Treaty of 92, which by the way, is the only one ratified by the Senate. And in my pragmatic world, that actually matters to get sort of the endorsement of your own body politic behind it. Uh, my boss at the time, Secretary <laughs> Baker, re re sort of tactfully recused himself because he owned oil stock. So I actually had to deal with this one kind of on, on my own. Um, but if you look at the design, I think there's lessons from that framework agreement. I mean, so for example, it was based on national action plans, which could be coordinated. It focused on sort of political, not legal commitments. And I was actually just discussing this with some climate change specialists at the end of the year about how in some ways I think countries are more willing to stretch for political than they might be sort of legal commitments. Because of the uncertainties, it built back feedback loops. So all these conferences of the parties, the new one we'll have in Glasgow, these are all part of the system. It also built feedback loops in for science, the IPCCC. So it was kind of a design to start to deal with the problem while recognizing sort of the, the pragmatic flexibility you have to have. At the time of the launch in 1992, I had some also big battles actually with the Germans on the notion that we should have sinks as well as sources <laughs> and also that there should be no, some notion of, of market trading. So that explains how these principles can be very important sort of going forward. And then the second example is the serendipity of life. I came back to this when I was at the World Bank and we did a lot obviously with climate and environmental or economic and development issues. And you'll recall there was the breakdown in Copenhagen. And so Mexico was going to hold the next conference of the parties. The president of Mexico, uh, President Calderon, was somebody I knew quite well. And so I went down to see him early on because I, I suspected that he thought he was just going to be the host while the UN did all the policy work. And I cautioned him that, <laughs> that if things came apart, it would all be on his shoulders. And so, uh, number one, I suggested how he needed to build together a, a team across his ministries, foreign, environmental, energy, finance, others, put somebody in charge. But then I gave him a suggestion. I said, because of these national action plans, there's nothing that prevents 150 countries from agreeing on a soil carbon and 160 on avoided deforestation and maybe 140 on some deal of adaptation and so on and so on and so on. And this became known as kind of the, the building block idea. And I was trying to get away from what I'll call the uh, sort of hierarchical UN structure where everybody has to agree to everything at once, <laughs> and which I had not worked clearly in the Copenhagen model. And then to, to sort of add an anecdote to this, the, he was quite successful in pulling this together. And then about the week before the conference started, I came down and I had lunch with him and I complimented him and I said, you know, Mr. President, as you pull together these building blocks, you can then frame this in one document, even if you don't have everybody agreeing to everything. And I said, but you have to be careful because as you start to move towards success, I said, some son of a bitch country, my guess is Bolivia, will try to hold you up. I said, so, so go back to your lawyers and look up the meaning of consensus because you probably think it means everybody. But in the wonderful world of international law, there's shadows of what it means to have everybody. And I said, you can maybe sort of edge one person out. And of course, that's exactly what happened. And they were able to push Bolivia to the side and sort of put together the deal. So as I mentioned to you, that's why I'm the proud holder of the Aztec Eagle, the highest award Mexico can give an a foreigner. But this, the, the main point is that this is the similar process that is followed uh, in the Paris Accord. It, and, and just to give people a little sense going forward, I would argue that for Glasgow, I would spread this network, not just to the government and traditional NGO bodies, but you can see that the private sector's adoption on this is gonna be very important. So I serve on some boards. On all the boards now, you can feel that the corporate governance requirement on climate is like it was on cybersecurity 10 years ago. And you can see it in the investment audience and you can see it from different aspects. So what I'm trying to pull together away from the specifics is,
how do you how do you conduct diplomacy with nation states dealing with their authorities and international system, but across some of these transnational topics that involve often non-governmental actors and, and different time horizons. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. And it's, uh, it's, it, I'd like to come back to that because it really is talking about the architecture in effect of international accords, um, which is really a crucial subject. I think Steve, could I invite you? I know you think a lot about alliances in the security context. I suspect this has been a great provocation on that score. Yeah, well, you know, Bob's repeated swipes at theory are an even <laughs> greater provocation for an institution like SEPA. Make, they make me a little concerned that perhaps too many of our students will be listening. Uh, our MIA students, uh, you know, have to take a course called Conceptual Foundations of International Politics in which they learn these theories that Bob is so unhappy with, perhaps we should invite him to come and speak to the class to uh, debunk all of them or explain to the students why they don't have to. Steve, my first piece of advice as a, as a practical person was, I would not have a course labeled missing in action. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, our, it's a degree and it's a, there's a long history here. Um, Bob's definition of pragmatism is, of course, what works, uh, but he uh, recognizes that uh, the, the past doesn't define what will work in the future. And so he has a couple of suggestions about what future policy uh, should be at this time of transition uh, that I want to push him on, uh, one about alliances and the other about American ideas, since they both are part of the five traditions that he, uh, that he mentions. Bob, you talk about the need to adapt and update American alliances. And you even have the sort of provocative phrase that it may be necessary to prune some security commitments. And I wondered whether you could explain that a little bit because, you know, American security commitments have often been thought as the spine that supports uh, economic cooperation. Um, so which of our allies are you going to push off the sled? So uh, it's an excellent question. And uh, just to uh, or offer a reclam on theory, in my pluralistic sense for the students, it is good to understand the theory and it's good to understand how people have thought about these issues. What I guess I'm suggesting is you need to go beyond it when it comes time to the practical problem solving as fits the question that you're asking. So uh, let me start first. I, th I think with NATO, um, it, it was a mistake of the United States to suggest to Ukraine and Georgia that there would be a path to membership. Um, I, don't, I don't think um, we were serious about having uh, our sons and daughters defend Ukraine and Georgia against threats. And I think the worst mistake is to perhaps provoke others without actually uh, defending. So that's kind of a, a prune, I guess I'd make from US past policy. In a current situation, and this again requires a little diplomatic finesse, that as you know, the, the NATO Article 5 commitments uh, from their design, and I explain this in the book, still leave a political decision. It isn't automatic. Yeah. And so for a country like Turkey today, I wouldn't push Turkey out of NATO because I think that the alliance system sort of gives you some useful reference points, ways of influence in it. But I would certainly make clear that the Article 5 provisions and protections wouldn't necessarily extend to protecting Turkey under some of the actions and circumstances uh, that, that it has taken. I might apply a similar approach uh, to the Philippines not in a heavy handed way because it would backfire against you, but certainly with the Philippine public uh, to emphasize that the alliance needs to be seen as a two way uh, partnership. Um, in the case of the Pacific, I think that our alliances with Japan and Korea will need to become increasingly mutual, uh, not only uh, for the two of them, but with us. I, a couple of years ago, I posed you know, to some Japanese that 
as, as you know, the interpretation of the US-Japanese alliance was that the United States would protect Japan. But for example, if there was an attack on an American ship, the Japanese may or may not sort of come to support. And I think if that happened, the alliance wouldn't last a day later. So those are some of the evolutions of this. And without getting into the great details, I think the prime case of this will be Taiwan. I, I think that um, whatever our national interest position is about Taiwan, my own is to protect its autonomy, not to achieve its sovereignty, um, and to sort of help it stay part of the market economic system. But operationally, we won't be able to deal with things like a potential quarantine from China unless you've got Japan's support. And so, and yet I'm not, and if, if we didn't, I think it would have a disastrous effect on Japanese confidence and security. But in doing so, I'm not sure that the Japanese public is necessarily aligned with kind of what that sort of might involve. So these, the context of this, I should have started with is that the United States created this system quite by accident, 1947 to 49. And I think it served us in the world quite well over 70 years, but you have to continue uh, to adapt it. Or a variation would be, sometimes Americans get over enthusiastic about the potential alliance with India. I don't think you're going to have an alliance with India. I think the history of India is that its own sense of sovereignty and independence and, and sensitivity from the colonial area, you could have a partnership and you need to understand the nature of the partnership, different sort of an alliance. And then there's the whole question about the changing agenda. So whether, and I think there's been some progress made on this in recent years. In the case of NATO, we have to be much more capable to deal with the type of hybrid threats that we saw in Crimea applied to the Balkans or cybersecurity issues. Um, so what I'm trying to suggest here is that alliances, I think, are a critical component of America's future posture. That would be in contrast from Trump's sort of transactional dismissive view. But we, we need to continue not to assume that they were just the form they were five, 10, or 15 years ago. They have to adapt, and in some cases, prune at the edge. <laughs> Like any good gardener, I think you're <laughs> you're ready to do some pruning. Um, let me uh, try to draw you out then on one of the other traditions that you mention, and it's actually uh, right there in the peroration of, of your book, which is advancing American uh, ideas and. I think this is a particularly important topic right now because there's a widespread sense among Americans that actually American ideas have perhaps led us to um, excess ambition, uh, to overcommitment, to thinking that we can remake the world in our image. Uh, that's a frequent way of trying to discredit a too ideological uh, approach to foreign policy. And this is nowhere more true than in the field of democracy promotion, for example, which I think in the Bush 43 administration became uh, perhaps more than it had ever been a, a, a kind of core slogan uh, of American foreign policy and one that made it easy to caricature what the administration uh, was doing. Um, but given that kind of skepticism, how does uh, a policymaker incorporate the tradition of advancing American ideas into foreign policy in the future and use it as an asset, as a source of strength? I mean, one of the things about Kissinger was that, and, and th I think it's a major failing of the diplomacy book is that he treats American ideas as kind of an inconvenience, you know, something that you have to uh, make a nod to in order to pacify uh, annoying domestic audiences. But uh, other people have, tr and you, I think your view is, uh, I'll risk speaking for you, is that advancing American ideas is not only a habit, but an asset. So how does that work in the future? So there's an excellent book titled Maximalist by a Columbia professor that reviews kind of the swinging uh, approach in the, in the post-World War II period. But I'll start a little earlier. And I, this, is, this is sort of the wonderful use of a good anecdote. 
Um, for those of you that still carry wallets, someday take out your wallet and look at the back of a dollar bill and you'll see the great seal of the United States. This is something I point out in my book. And you probably haven't focused much on it, but you'll recall there's this unfinished pyramid and note it's unfinished. And there's the eye of providence above it and below it, novus order seclorum, new order of the ages. And I use that to point out from the very founding of the United States, these people weren't just trying to create a new type of nation state republic. They had big ideas <laughs> about trying to shape the world system. And I think what I try to suggest is that the, those, the, the idea of what the purpose is changes over time. It's sort of a combination of the external context, it's public support, and, but it's also some idea of freedom or republic or others. And so to answer your question more specifically, Steve, you know, it always starts at home. <laughs> it depends on what example we provide. And, you know, there's the power of attraction, you know, whether it was the EU versus Eastern Europe or the United States uh, at various points around the world. Uh, second, um, I, I draw out an idea for John Quincy Adams that I think uh, Traub first pointed that out in his, his biography, which is he called him American realist. As you know, Kissinger likes John Quincy Adams because of his, some of his realist comments. But what I point out was that when you listen to or read John Quincy Adams sort of statements, they ring an awful lot like Ronald Reagan or George W. Bush in, about the moral superiority of republicanism. Now, the difference was uh, John Quincy Adams emphasized that the right to self-government is not the same as the capacity to self-government. And he, given his skeptical nature, believed maybe even the Europeans couldn't come to this and certainly Latin America sort of wouldn't reach it. I think we've learned some positive <laughs> possibilities uh, over the course of 200 years. But where I think his caution is helpful is that when I worked in these areas, I always tried to focus on building the, the institutions, the political, the social, the economic uh, infrastructure. And let me give you a very practical example that we face today. So I also emphasize the theme of North America in my book. And I talk about the transformation of Mexico from the 80s on. And I think NAFTA helped really build a lot of the economic institutions of Mexico. I mean the Bank of Mexico, the finance ministry, these are world-class institutions. It didn't spread as much to issues of justice, uh, anti-corruption, sort of rule of law. And one of the provisions in the new rewrite, the USMCA, is actually some quite extensive labor standards that will allow, uh, frankly, uh, litigants in the United States to bring cases against individual companies. Now, this is where the devil gets in the details of pragmatism and practical application. These could either be turned, uh, you know, as, as Merritt knows, into super protectionism to block everything that they would like to sell, or you could use them to help build labor unions and sort of build this rule of law structure. So that's where the practical work comes in. Similarly with Central America, uh, it's another area I tried to work on at the World Bank or start some work, which is this is a sensitive term, whether you call them fragile states or post-conflict states, but the idea that you needed a combination of security, economic, and governance and how they were sort of integrated. Um, so that's an important field. And I guess the last thing is, as all of you would know from your experience and your study, is democracy movements tend to go in waves. Um, and we've seen them sometimes in Latin America, then a receding. I think you see this in Sub-Saharan uh, Africa. My own view in a practical sense is when those move forward, you need models of success to point to, not just developed democracies, but sort of developing economy democracies. You need to be patient. The locals have to own it, but you can help them develop the capacity uh, to succeed. And uh, again, a practical example would be, you know, while I wouldn't give NATO support to Ukraine, I think the United States has a large investment in the success of Ukrainian democracy and economy. So that would be a priority for me. On the positive side, uh, there was a bipartisan effort to do this with Colombia when the Plan Colombia effort in the late 90s, sort of early uh, 2000s. Certainly South Korea is a wonderful success story and the Philippines is an in-between case. So I think there's enough examples from history that this can work, but if you expect it to be kind of work on a sort of direct straight line formula, or, you know, then you're bound to be disappointed. And that's where it goes to the ongoing challenge. I personally, I agree with you. It's one of the reasons as I wrote the book, I was trying to 
respect what Kissinger has to say, but differentiate from the American experience, because I do think this is always part of American diplomacy. You just listen to the Biden, I suppose the Trump administration might be a slight contrast, but, uh, and then the question is, how do you do it effectively? Well, thank you very much. Let me bring Tom Christensen into this conversation. I know he's been thinking about transitions in China and many, many related fields. Yeah, thanks a lot, Merritt. Uh, thanks, Bob, for doing this. And it's a great book. It's really terrific. It kind of puts us uh, scholars to shame when someone who's as busy as you on your spare time can write such a, a masterful scholarly work. And, well, I relied uh, on all of your work. So, I mean, if you, that's right. I tried to be fair to the notes here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I'm interested in transitions. We're going through a transition now between uh, two very different administrations. And uh, transitions have a big impact on, on foreign policy, not only because presidents have different worldviews, but they bring on a whole raft of political appointees who populate the uh, very different agencies within the government that deal with foreign relations. Um, and I I'm curious, since this seems like a pretty dramatic transition that we're going through now between the Trump administration and the Biden administration, uh, in the history uh, that you studied, what do you think are some of the examples of really consequential and dramatic transitions between administrations? And what lessons can we draw from those experiences to try to uh, make the current transition into the Biden administration smoother and more effective? It's a great question, Tom. So uh, I guess I I'd start in 1800, uh, not only because Thomas Jefferson's presidency was certainly uh, a very uh, sort of the formation of our political party system, but also Jefferson had a very different approach than sort of Washington and Adams did. I, I, I titled him the futurist because he's a person that brought ideas of, and sort of visions. But I focused in particular in that chapter on the Louisiana Purchase because I wanted to bring the futurist home to the practical work of diplomacy. And my real question was, was Jefferson lucky or was he good <laughs> in this, this, this challenge? Um, and I'll, I'll leave uh, others to read it and make their judgment. But one of the things that you do see is to be successful, he would have never had the money to purchase this except for Alexander Hamilton's bonds, the financial system that, that he uh, opposed. And uh, actually, even as the Napoleonic Wars sort of restarted, Britain kindly allowed us to transfer the specie to France for the purchase. Um, and of course, he faced the tricky issue that the Constitution did not give him the authority to buy Louisiana. He hesitates for a moment and says, oh, maybe I need to ask for a constitutional amendment. Unfortunately, the practical Madison says, no, we're going to use the Hamiltonian interpretation. So I suppose one idea is uh, draw on your predecessors flexibly, <laughs> even if they come from different camps. Um, obviously, 1861 and Lincoln and Seward is, a, is another one of these fundamental juncture points. It's interesting, Seward draws, uh, his first idea is what it was referred to as the foreign war panacea. Maybe we can unite Americans by going to war with, with Spain over, in that case, it was uh, sort of Santo Domingo. And, uh, you know, to be honest, you're in the China field. I sometimes wonder a little bit if our new sort of uh, attack on China is partly a way for some people for their own domestic political sort of motives here. Um, and of course, Lincoln had the wise idea of fighting one war at a time. Um, and the, the diplomacy of stopping foreign invention is, you don't read much about it. You read about civil war battles and generals and social effects, but it was quite successful. Another period that interests me a lot, has some parallels to today, is sort of 1921. So this is right after Woodrow Wilson has failed with the Versailles Treaty. The Senate is really feeling its oats at this time. It, you know, the uh, Republican senator, so the president's party, says it doesn't matter who's Secretary of State, we're gonna run everything here anyway. So Charles Evans Hughes, I explain how he returns authority to the executive branch, but also he uses this Washington conference, not just to come up with naval arms control, but to connect it with a regional security agenda. And I, this is, uh, and Adams also, his, his book Deluge focuses on this. And, and this is important because if I think about issues like North Korea today or Iran, I think some, some of the commentary that focuses purely on the nuclear arms control issues misses that you have to incorporate this in a larger set of regional security agenda. Cordell Hall with the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act of 1934, sort of reversing the protectionist policy of Smoot uh, Hawley is another set of good example. And what's important there was he not only reduced tariffs and barriers, but he did 31 
uh, or yeah, 31 agreements with 28 countries that set the principles that became the basis so of the modern GATT system. Uh, Nixon and Kissinger working off the defeat of Vietnam sort of used triangular diplomacy in this way. Yeah, you could argue Ronald Reagan kind of did the, the, the same way. There are some other periods where I think are hinge points, but it's not so much transition. So um, another one was clearly the John Hay, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Woodrow Wilson, rise of American power then the 47, 49 period, the American alliance system. If I apply that to today, Tom, you know, Trump in some ways is the antithesis of a lot of what's in the book because he basically wanted to reverse the North American policy, disparage the alliances. He was hostile to trade and open markets. <clears throat> and I, so I think for President Biden, one of the challenges will be you know, what aspects does he rehabilitate? Kind of which does he revise? Goes in a little bit to some of Steve's sort of question. I think one issue I would draw out that maybe is kind of under the surface is the tension between the new fad for great power politics, which by the way, was always there. The idea that H.R. McMaster discovered it is a little crazy, um, but also how do you deal with the transnational issues that Adam mentioned? You know, are, if your policy towards China is simply confrontation and condemnation, how are you gonna deal with economics, biological security, other sort of topics? So those are kind of the questions of how they sort of get managed together. And if I would draw out one more that I'm somewhat concerned about, I, I think that the Biden administration's desire for multilateralism and partnerships will depend somewhat on their international economic policy. And I'm suspicious, I don't know uh, kind of what merits view on this, but I'm afraid that they're somewhat cautious because of protectionist consti uh, con uh, constituencies. And if anybody knows anything about East Asia in particular, but also the European Union, you're not gonna get very far in a partnership unless you've got some economic and trade agenda. So, so that's, a, that's a great lead in for my second question, which is, you know, I look at your career and I see you as uh, uh, being in an unusually uh, uh, authoritative position to respond to this because you led uh, major agencies involved in economic policy. You were a leader in uh, national security policy as Deputy Secretary of State. Um, and I want, to, want you to explore the relationship between economic policy and alliance policy. Because in your book, you show pretty convincingly that uh, good alliance policy and security partnership policy is critically important to US competitive advantage uh, after World War II uh, during the Cold War. And in other writings, you've said that the uh, alliance relationships and security partnerships uh, it, that the United States enjoys today will be uh, critically important to our competition with China. So I'm interested in what, how you think economic policy interacts and supports good alliance, po good alliance policy or security partnership policy and how can it undercut it? Um, and looking at the contemporary con uh, competition with China, do you think that the protectionism and the economic nationalism, which in my opinion, unfortunately is prevalent in both political parties now in the United States uh, will allow for uh, a competitive economic policy to bolster those alliances uh, in uh, organizations like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and maybe uh, an upgraded and reformed WTO uh, or in uh, the world of uh, development finance or development aid uh, to compete with China in those arenas. Uh, is it possible that we can pull out of that uh, protectionist and economic nationalist uh, trend enough to actually compete effectively in, the, in those areas? Well, I think uh, I, I appreciate your compliment about the economic and security. Uh, this is obviously is a key area for Adam's work, which I've suggested a lot of people. And I'm glad he's applied it to the more recent period with crashed as well as an earlier period. I think the lesson is it starts with strength at home, always starts with strength at home. Um, and frankly, you know, if I were President Biden's chief of staff, I'd be devoting 80% of my time to successful vaccinations and the pandemic and the economic recovery. So you know, when my boss Baker was chief of staff to Ronald Reagan in 1981, he said to Reagan, Reagan, Mr. President, you have three priorities, economic recovery, economic recovery, and economic recovery. And Stephen and I talked about this, this delayed Hague's efforts to sort of bomb Cuba into submission. Uh, because they thought starting a war wouldn't be the best way to sort of move ahead the economic recovery. Um, and I, I would add to that, um, 
the idea which we've touched on about American investment in technology and innovation. So it's not only the recovery, but it's going forward. Um, a second and related point, one of the things that particularly troubled me about the Trump approach, which is that uh, while I certainly have uh, my differences with China, I think that chasing China by trying to close off the United States is a losing proposition. Openness is our Trump card. So whether it's openness to goods, to people, to capital, to ideas, you know, the idea that we're going to close off our universities to foreign students, make it harder for immigrants to trade, you know, fine if China wants to do that. I think China's going to be playing a losing hand. We shouldn't follow it. Um, the third point would be, I think the political realities are President Biden's going to be very much focused not only on pandemic and economic recovery, but he's got issues of immigration and, and sort of race and climate. I think you'll see them try to leverage the domestic agenda internationally. This builds a little bit on sort of Adam's point. Um, and I think there's ways you can do that, but probably along with Steve, I'd also say you can't lose track of the traditional security agenda just as, as you do this. Um, I think that as I alluded to, I, unfortunately I worry that if, if Biden is too limited on trade because of the protectionist constituencies, you're gonna fall behind in your your effort to sort of reestablish relations. The I know from <laughs> one senior appointee who uh, just in the weeks before he was named gave some remarks where he said some nice things about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He didn't say we should join, he just said some nice things. And of course he was called up by the White House already and sort of said, you know, you can't ever say these sort of things. Um, and, and also as, as your work suggests, this is where Americans need to also look what's happening in the rest of the world. There's an assumption that East Asia still depends on an export market to the United States. It's no doubt important, but the intra-Asia market development, you know, is a huge phenomenon and it's going to go ahead anyway. And so we have to decide whether we want to play in it or not. Um, and then, you know, in trade policy, it, it may be a homily merit, probably though, I think would agree with me. You're either on defense or offense. You're either dealing with sort of protecting this constituency, you know, this complaint, or you've got an offensive agenda. And if you can't move on TPP right now, well then what about a digital agenda? I mean, in my business world's activities, most companies now are dealing, it's a question of big data and algorithms and how they incorporate this. You could do a lot in sort of digital issues in a sense in a, in, within a trade agenda. And frankly, perhaps have a little bit more freedom with the Congress than you would through some of the traditional barriers. Or another step, like one that I promoted, is there's been almost no attention to the what happens to Britain after Brexit. <laughs> and so, for example, and and you know, for all of Britain's difficulties, it's still a major economy, intelligence, military, others. And so I would be trying to embrace it, for example, with not just a US free trade agreement, but a North American free trade agreement. And I'd use this to kind of move ahead the digital agenda. And I'd test the unions about their seriousness because can they really complain about labor conditions in Britain as we go forward? It would be a way of moving the agenda uh, forward because otherwise what, what my experience in trade policy is you devolve the kind of case by case management. And, and it's kind of you know dealing with Boeing Airbus, dealing you know, with this suit or that suit or others. And, and you, you don't really frame the policy going forward. And just to take this one step further, and this shows again, kind of the practical approach, you know, uh, there's been understandable frustration with some of the Chinese debt problems in developing countries. And at least my understanding is China said, look, it's willing to restructure the Exim bank debt, but not the China development bank debt because it wants to treat it as commercial bank debt. On the other hand, the United States has refused to go forward with a proposal about special drawing rights in the IMF. Okay, um, and there's pros and cons to that. <laughs> but if I were the Biden administration, I'd look long and hard about whether I could move on the SDR proposal in exchange for China mm -hmm. doing more on the debt issues. And you use a neutral form so that it's not, you know, no sort of face saving for all parties and helps the IMF do it. And as all of you know, there, there are lots of those around there where the creative mind can kind of find a win-win solution. I, I was struck by, <laughs> One of the more the Chinese reformers who had worked with Zhu Ranji uh, on a call I was on a couple of months ago, he said, we're not just in a zero sum strategy. We're in a lose lose strategy here. It's kind of how much we can hurt one another. That just doesn't strike me as productive for either of us over the long run.
Thanks very much. Well, thank you. Let me jump in with a trade question uh, uh, or two, and then we will uh, take up some questions uh, from our audience. So please feel free to send your questions in. Um, I'd like to have you speak a little bit to the congressional executive relationship in the trade context. And um, I feel there's some lessons from this last period we've been through. We shouldn't forget them as we look to the future. Um, and you have some marvelous uh, description in your book about Cordell Hull and the struggles he had and the executive branch had with the Congress and then how the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act of 1934 was used by the executive branch because of course uh, commerce is a congressional right that's delegated to the executive branch. So it had to be delegated authority for uh, the executive branch to negotiate these uh, agreements on tariff reductions. And it's in that authority where the executive branch has the right to raise tariffs. And so, um, uh, you know, this has, this was the dynamic for a very long time that the executive branch would use this authority and Congress was usually pushing uh, uh, the executive branch to do more, to be tougher on trade, to negotiate more market opening. But then during the Trump administration, you saw some well-established tools like 301 and national security-based laws moving in new directions uh, and where the president would unilaterally uh, uh, impose and threaten sanctions, uh, both vis-a-vis countries like China with whom we had deep grievances and others uh, that we think of as our allies and friends. Now that's not unfamiliar, but it seemed to be coming uh, with, um, I would say, uh, a lot of frequency and, and a lot, not a lot of consideration about sort of the magnitude of the, of the aggregate effects. And, and in fact, you have the president say trade wars are good and easy to win and a lot of market anxiety about that. So I guess I'm, I'm inviting you to reflect on this history and the period we've just been in and, and ask, do we have the right checks and balances in the system of trade that's been created as between executive and congressional relations? And you know, what if the president exceeds his authority? Will the Congress rein it in? How do you think about this period we've just been in? Well, I, I'll just start uh, with the Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act. It's a wonderful thing for people to go back to. It shows the benefit of doing the primary resource as well as relying on the secondary sources. The whole act itself is three pages long. <laughs> it's this major piece of legislation, three pages long. I mean, imagine that sort of today. Um, so you described the problem extremely well, Senator Merritt. And I, uh, my own view is that um, you know, with the right presidential leadership, the executive is still likely to be a greater liberalizer than, than Congress, which kind of will engage in sort of the log rolling of, of protecting local interests. However, you know, when, uh, when Congress was picking up action on the USMCA, the NAFTA rewrite, as you know, the way agreements get put into laws, there's actually implementing legislation under the Trade Promotion Authority or the old Fast Track for agreements being done for an up or down vote. And Congress works quite closely with the administration before they submit it. And I had made the suggestion to some members of Congress that they could use the implementing legislation to roll back some of the most absurd provisions like the 232 national security sort of application where we're worried about Canada and Mexico being our enemy, which uh, I think since the Rush Badgett Treaty of 1817, we'd actually kind of overcome most of that one. Um, and. Uh, and you could see, actually, I think uh, Senator Grassley got some commitments on the 232 in that process. But you know, the nature of the executive legislative process, whether it's through implementing legislation, whether it's through appropriations, whether it's through hearings, um, certainly these are, are leverage points. Um, and one of the reasons that I think that Trump's action against the appropriations process for the wall with Mexico was such a constitutional offense is that it went to the heart of Congress's appropriation power. Um, and my own view is that uh, the Congress was uh, sort of rather uh, a much a lapdog on some of these issues over the sort of recent times. I think there's ways they could push back. 
And based on the logic that you described, going back to Cordell Hall, it's also, it, while it requires some political courage, it also can involve, for example, supporting other constituencies. America's farmers, if we go to a world where everybody's got food security and they're supposed to grow their own food, well, good luck if you're in America's heartland and farmers. And by the way, there's a lot of farm states, there's a lot of senators, and so there's, there's sort of the political basis of this. Now, Trump got around that by giving them even bigger sort of bailouts and sort of subsidies. But these are some of the dynamics that I wish sort of Congress would exert uh, on the overall policy. In the book, I touch on this a little bit in my use of Vandenberg in the chapter on 47, 49. I, I wanted to bring him in. And I've actually talked about this with a couple of sitting senators. There's some wonderful little lessons there, how he used sort of hearings and sort of issues to bring people along. There's this one quote I came across where he had some language that didn't really say much. And one of his colleagues said, why don't we delete it? And he said, oh, you can't delete that because I'm going to point to 12 different people and say how this language deals with their concern. That's sort of part of the, the, the nature of the legislative <laughs> politics. Um, but at the end of the day, Merritt, I do still think that uh, the bulk of Congress is going to respond to the squeaky wheel in local constituencies, which brings you back to the executive branch. And here, this is where I have a little difference with sort of the, the current conventional wisdom. There's a view that, oh, well, this was easy before and now it's become hard in the past 20 years because we face more difficult combination. This has always been a challenge. <laughs> and, and I use a story from 1947 that I came across, one of my favorites. So there was an underappreciated man named Will Clayton, which is a critical sort of contributor to the Marshall Plan and early GAD and so on and so forth. But he's trying to, build off the principles of Cordell Hull's trade agreements and create the GATT in 1947. And I think the original negotiation was with 23 different economies. And while he's doing this, the Congress passes a big 50% increase in the wool tariff. Well, for Australia in those days, that was the major export. So Australia says, if you do that, we're pulling out. And then Britain, because of the Commonwealth, said, we're pulling out. And the Europeans said at that point, well, if Britain pulls out, we don't really have much interest in this. So, so uh, poor Clayton comes all the way back to the United States to see President Truman. Fortunately, he had a good relationship with him. And Truman gives him 15 minutes and the Secretary of Agriculture 15 minutes to discuss this topic. And I, you know, to be honest, I've been in meetings like this where <laughs> the Secretary of Agriculture says, oh, who cares about all those foreigners and that GAD thing's not going to do anything. And by the way, you're going to lose up to seven wool producing states in the 1948 election unless you sign this bill. And poor Clayton has to make the macro trade point of view. And the next day, Truman, to his credit, vetoes the bill and authorizes a 25% tariff cut for, for Clayton, which Clayton says most politically courageous act he sort of ever, ever seen in his life. Now, I tell that story because, you know, we were supposed to be pretty powerful in 1947 with 50% of the world's GDP. This has never been easy. And so I, I kind of bring that back to today, which is that, you know, I, I, I actually believe you could put together a new pro-trade coalition with some environmental topics, sort of healthcare, some data issues, others, and, and deal with some of the labor issues that have you know, sort of came out in the USMCA. But you need a policy entrepreneur sort of willing to, to do this. Um, my own guess, I have to say, is we probably won't. But then what will happen is reality will intrude and the US will fall behind. Uh, and uh, not only in terms of openness of market, but critically in setting standards for the future will be the sort of critical issue. And then for people who care about these issues, you have to be ready with a positive agenda when the moment appears, which is kind of going back to what I was trying to do in 2001. If you look at the free trade agreements the United States has, we have them with 20 countries. Um, and frankly, uh, the only one I wasn't involved with was Israel in the 80s. So I was part of NAFTA and all the rest of them flow from this burst that we sort of started. And it wasn't just those agreements and their sort of the trade aspects. It was the standards and rules and how you put them together. So I remember talking with Mike Froman pointing out the Obama US trade representative, he would have never been able to do the Trans-Pacific Partnership with 11 other economies, except for the fact that we already have free trade agreements with six of them. So the kind of the, the principles were built in. So this is the idea of how you kind of need to, to build these over time. And my excuse is that Cordell Hull had 11 years and nine months and I only had four years. <laughs>
<laughs> well, thank you very much. I, I see the questions are mounting, so I will uh, turn to those, but that's a wonderful, wonderful entry. Um, okay, I'll start with the shortest and then uh, absorb some of these others to communicate to you. One of them is if you could give one piece of advice to Secretary of State Blinken, let me add a Columbia Law graduate, what would it be? Well, this, this will get a little tactical. Um, so Adam might like this one from a practical point of view. The, the main piece of advice is stay close to the president. So the secretary of state more than any other job in the US government has to have a close working relationship with the president. Because otherwise you got the NSC staff, people like Steve who kind of interfere all the time. You have the White House staff, every other department in the US government thinks they've got a foreign policy. So, and, and this is a little idea I kind of run through my book, you know, even Baker, who I worked for, was very close friends with, with uh, President Bush 41. He had private meetings set up a couple times a week. Um, every night we'd send over a night note instead of one page that would be in President Bush's intelligence materials to kind of keep him in touch, particularly when we were traveling, because Bush liked to have a sense of kind of the, the point of the spear, the aspect of the diplomacy. Um, now, Tony has the advantage of having a prior relationship with, with President Biden. So that, that's a good starting point. However, it, it really was a staffer relationship. And that, that will be one of his challenges, I think, is whether he can make the grade up to principal. And as we were talking before on some of the environmental issues, he's now got a lead person who's a former Secretary of State, John Kerry. And so how will you integrate the climate policy with your other policy? So uh, this is less a policy suggestion. If I were gonna make one policy suggestion, it's the one that you and I and Tom just talked about, which is you, you're, never, you're not really gonna be successful unless you have international economic and trade policy as part of this. Thank you very much. Well, I see that Steve Sistanovich's uh, perspective has influenced one question here, which is in the spirit of pruning alliances for the new era, as well as uh, advancing democracy and human rights uh, uh, in the Biden administration, where would you place the U.S.-Turkey relationship in light of uh, Turkey's uh, aggressive relations in the region and its cozying up to Russia? Well, I, I, I touched on that a little bit. Um, I, I would, I would uh, use the existing uh, sort of institutional relationships through NATO, but also frankly through some economic matters um, to try to caution the Turks about some of the policies that may conflict with uh, sort of US interests, whether that's elsewhere in the Middle East, whether it's the new Ottoman Empire, which is aggressive policies. Now, how you do this, this is where, you know, diplomacy doesn't always get done by the megaphone. <laughs> <laughs> if you confront somebody like Erdogan sort of directly, he's going to respond to his sort of political constituencies. Um, but I, I do think we're seeing increasing tensions between Turkey's perception of its international interests and uh, the, the U.S. type. By the way, I would also do this in concert with my European partners um, because, you know, Merkel did her deal with Erdogan so as to stop people from coming uh, into Europe. And that's a politically destabilizing issue. You've seen Macron have these issues. So this is a good example of where you wanna emphasize sort of the alliance aspect uh, of your diplomacy um, in cooperation uh, with your other partners. Thank you very much. Well, here is a, a question coming out of the European uh, experience and it's a lengthy one and I will, I will have to summarize it. Um, and it references uh, your own reference to Helmut Kohl's courageous decision to go along with the NATO doppel Beschluss and allowing the stationing of, of short range nuclear missiles in Germany. The question is as pivotal as that decision was, it relied on a strong alliance, but it also triggered enormous resistance within the German population. And it wasn't a decision led by populism, but there was a certain principled pragmatism involved, says the questioner. So where do you see the dangers of mixing populism with pragmatism, as well as the alliances uh, triggering resistance? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, I'd extend it further. It, it really began with Helmut Schmidt. 
Helmut Schmidt, who I had the pleasure of knowing, was a great leader. He, he lost his, his position as chancellor because he took a, a in a sense, his party was uh, resistant on this, the Social Democrats. And eventually, what put Kohl in office was the Free Democratic Party moved to coalition uh, with the CDU CSU. By the way, a little sub point here. Um, it's another example when we talk about history, about understanding other people's experience. I often found that US officials didn't have much of a sense of how other party coalitions would work because we're kind of used to our electoral system, maybe the British uh, parliamentary system. Um, in 1989-90, you know, we had to deal with Genscher and the Free Democrats and the CDU CSU. And sometimes it was a little hard for some of my colleagues to recognize that uh, Genscher couldn't be aligned exactly where Cole was because what would be the reason for the Free Democrats to exist? So there's a little insight on the policy there. As for the, the, uh, the populism in principle, look, uh, sometimes I think leaders have to take stands that are not necessarily politically easy or popular. It's easier for me to say that. I'm not an elected official. They put their, their lines on, their careers on the line. The most skilled ones, and this is what I really admire across different political systems, have the ability to bring their public along. My chapter on Reagan, and Steve went through this, is kind of is a good example. I think foreign policy specialists still have a hard time understanding Reagan. And, and I, I focused on his, his, his speeches and how he really used his writing to kind of sharpen his own ideas and sort of logic. And this went back to his experience on radio and, and uh, with, with GE and others. And he was an autodidact. This is how he kind of came to his conclusions. And uh, I don't think it was enough. I think this is where George Schultz played a critical role was engaging him in the negotiation process. And as Steve knows, in some areas like the Middle East, if, if you didn't have the right partners, it could be a disastrous approach. But it, it's important to kind of understand that nature of, of uh, political leadership. And you know, I bring that back to not surprisingly, the trade agenda today. I, you know, Biden knows that we should be doing something differently. He supported NAFTA. He used to support TPP. I understand that politicians have to set priorities, and he probably doesn't want to have the trade fight right now. Um, but that's one reason, for example, I suggested the North America UK idea because the Trade Promotion Authority expires in the middle of this year. But I think you could get it extended to do a UK deal. Um, and I've discussed this with actually some Republican senators. So to bring it back to the German position, I think uh, where, where Cole was an extraordinary leader was that he had a fingertip feel, uh, or as Adam would know, it's finger Spitzengefühl for, for local politics. He knew the birthdays of his party members. He, he had that incredible feel, but on the big issues about alliance relations, uh, European relations, he had some very strong principled visions that did guide his policy. Now, this is where alliance relations, it got easier if he had some support. You know, you'd have to ask, you know, even with those strong views, would, would it have worked out in 89, 90 if you didn't have the partnership with the United States in the same way that you did? You had a momentum on the ground, you had British and French opposition, the Soviets weren't so keen on the idea. So this is where the United States can play a catalytic role and help partners. And I'll close with this point. I, I have great admiration in many respects for, for Chancellor Merkel. I like her personally. I like her scientific analytical sense. I do sometimes feel at points over the past 10 or 15 years, a little bit of that sort of cold sense of vision might have been more called for. Well, thank you so much. Uh, as I expected, our time has just flown by. I know every one of us would like to ask many more questions and take our conversation further, but we've run out of time. So first, let me thank all of those who have joined us this afternoon. And second, thank Bob Zellick so much for this wonderful time together with you and with your book. We invite you back, each one of us and all of us, and look forward to it. And colleagues, thank you for your great comments and uh, our shared experience this afternoon. Thank you all very, very much. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Great to have you. Bye.